Sidereal. I have been saying sidereal wrong my whole life. Welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. I'm your host, Ophelian, and uh, thank you all so much for the love you have shown me on the last episode. That is the first episode that has banged views in a very long time, so I appreciate you guys listening and viewing that episode. Uh, Today's episode is on an astronomer that I struggle to say the name of, and he is Carl Schwarzschild. I looked up the pronunciation to make sure that I was getting it right, and previously I'd been getting it wrong, I obviously realized, and so I finally learned how to say his name. So, two words sum up his work, general relativity, and in this episode we're going to look into everything that Schwarzschild did in general relativity namely the exact solution to Einstein's field equations and how he landed on the Schwarzschild solution. So um, let's get right into all of that. And also I will mention some uh, important photochemical discoveries that he made in this episode as well. So yeah, anyways, let's get into the first section of our episode, which has to do with biographical details. Schwarzschild was born in 1873 in Frankfurt, and he was Jewish, which is an important characteristic of astronomers at the turn of the 20th century, because um, astronomers that come through at this time uh, who are Jewish bring some diversity to a field of astronomy that has historically been dominated by white males, and so that's kind of Um, an important part of the field of astronomy, the fact that it's historically lacked diversity, which I've mentioned before in previous episodes. Uh, Schwarzschild attended the University of Strasbourg, then transferred to Munich for his studies, and he completed his doctorate in 1896 for work on a French mathematician's theories. Uh, He first worked at the Kuffner Observatory in Vienna after college in 1897, and here he worked on photometry, which we will talk about in a brief moment. From 1901 to 1909, he taught at the University of Göttingen. I think that's how you say it. I'm probably wrong. And something interesting about the University of Göttingen, or however you pronounce the university's name, It was kind of the university for German science and possibly European science solely on the fact that so many prominent people worked at the University of Gotingen at least for a while. Uh, There are people that came to the university like Einstein, Carl Frederick Gauss, and Riemann, uh, even though they were from like way before uh, Schwarzschild, uh, Otto Hahn, Heisenberg, Robert Millikan, uh, Oppenheimer, Max Planck. All of these people had some academic experience at the University of Göttingen. And so that's that's a very interesting part about the University of Göttingen, uh, I will say. In, eight, uh, in 1912, sorry, uh, Schwarzschild became a member of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, and then in 1914, the Great War broke out, and he volunteered for service. In 1915, he wrote three amazing scientific papers while suffering from a blistering autoimmune disease, and he also um, was on the Eastern Front for Germany at the time, which is quite extraordinary, I will say, but unfortunately he did die in 1960, shortly after he left the army. So, with that being said, let's get into the incredible work of Carl Schwarzschild. Firstly, in 1897, as I promised, I would talk about some uh, photometry and photochemical work. So here, uh, Schwarzschild developed a law that described optical density of photographic material as a function of the intensity of light from the source and exposure time to the power of a unique constant, which is known as the Schwarzschild exponent now. And a quote that sort of sums up this matter uh, goes, In determinations of stellar brightness by the photographic method, I have recently been able to confirm once more the existence of such deviations and to follow them up in a quantitative way, and to express them in the following rule, which should replace the law of reciprocity. I think that's how you say that word. Sources of light of different intensity I cause the same degree of blackening under different exposures T if the products I times T to the power of 0.186, sorry, 0.86, are equal. And, um, 
0 0.86 uh, for the record is not the correct uh, Schwarzschild exponent, but it represents the placement in the function. So um, everything other than, than the 0 0.86 is pretty much just the function that tells you about the optical density of photographic material. So what's important about this discovery is that it has everything to do with astrophotography because reciprocity failure is an issue. Uh, if the duration of light exposure doesn't align with actual intensity of light coming from a source, which is what uh, reciprocity failure is, um, that causes flaws in the observational data. So that's the first thing that Schwarzschild did. Now, circa 1900, he was also responsible for a work titled On the Permissible Numerical Value of the Curvature of Space. And here is where some very, very interesting ideas pop up. Uh, in this work, Schwarzschild begins to consider the use of non-Euclidean geometry or hyperbolic geometry to illustrate the space in which the universe is contained while also considering an elliptical space in which the universe might exist. And if you have no clue what hyperbolic geometry is and you'd like to look into it yourself, um, you're welcome to click off of this video and watch some other ones that will tell you about the subject before coming back to this video because um, it's very nice to visualize things when we talk about theory and um, unfortunately I cannot give you a sufficient hyperbolic geometry um, or a sufficient explanation on hyperbolic geometry even if I wanted to and there are some people out there that explain it way better than I do so I don't even mind that you go and watch a different YouTube video before you come back to this one. Um, so yeah, Schwarzschild prefaces this work by stating, quote, here we are come into a fairyland of geometry, which is especially beautiful due to the fact that it may relate to our real world, and finally we are unsure in the impossibility of it. Here we consider how wide the boundaries of this fairyland can be expanded, what is the largest numerical value of the permissible curvature of space, uh, curvature of space, sorry I don't know what happened to my brain there, and what is the smallest radius of the space curvature. So ultimately we know we're going to get into some crazy theory when we hear um, Schwarzschild mention some fairylands that can be expanded to the extremes. Uh, in the text, he starts us off with, quote, among the possible forms of space which permit spherical trigonometry, the simplest and most well-known are the so-called spherical space and the elliptical space. And once he's laid down some foundations uh, for this idea, he considers uh, hypotheses which create the foundations of a spherical space first uh, using similar principles. And he lands on the conclusion that, quote, the simplest of these spatial forms is the so-called pseudo-Riemannian or hyperbolic space where the amount of curvature that is caused by it is too small to be observed. And this is a lot to take in, so here's what I'm going to tell you. The reason why I'm, uh, I'm telling you this and what I'm trying to convey here is that Schwarzschild is doing something astounding. For a huge part of the history of science, classical mechanics and Euclidean geometry and very simple uh, mathematical foundations have been used in scientific theory regarding space. You know, we just take these uh, simple uh, sort of circular orbits, perfect circular orbits, and we assume, okay, well, that's how uh, satellites kind of rotate around planets or even like Earth. But what... Um, Schwarzschild is doing here is he's sort of taking our understanding of astronomy to another level by incorporating some relatively new ideas like hyperbolic geometry and um, other forms of non-Euclidean geometry and kind of, you know, putting taking that into consideration. And he, he brings some value to these considerations by, you know, discussing like how would we measure parallax and putting some math behind it, some equations. Uh, finding some numbers and seeing how realistic um, some of these uh, spaces that the universe can exist in, um, how realistic they are. And he recognizes that imagining the universe as an elliptical space is more comfortable of a thought to us because it assumes the universe finite, whereas with a hyperbolic space you have to assume that um, 
the uh, space in which the universe exists is very, very huge and almost infinite. So what this really feels like is a step in the direction of space could be really, really huge and there could be more to the story than we think there is rather than just like, you know, um, staying close to this elliptic space that he discusses. And he doesn't just get rid of the elliptic space kind of uh, possibility. He puts some math behind it and he states that the radius of curvature would be very huge and we'd have to assume like a homogeneous universe and a more you know finite state compared to uh the hyperbolic state so yeah uh i think that's pretty much all i wanted to say about that part um just slow down take a breather because i know that was quite a lot um directly from the text once again he does conclude and i just want to put this out there uh, it is possible to imagine with no contradiction of the experimental data that the world is closed within a hyperbolic or pseudospherical space, the curvature radius of which is larger than 4 million radii of the Earth's orbit, or alternatively within an elliptic space, the curvature radius of which is larger than 100 million radii of the Earth's orbit. In addition, in the second case, it should be supposed an absorption of light equal to 40 stellar magnitudes per around space travel. So that's just a little bit more nuance to the elliptic space uh, possibility because he realized some problems with how light travels and how they intersect and stuff like that. So that's pretty much all I have to say about that work uh, afterwards and until 1906. There aren't really any specific works to look at and... In 1906, uh, Schwarzschild began to look into geometric optics. Uh, for the sake of staying on topic uh, for this episode, I'm going to not get too deep into that, as well as some of the other um, work he did on electrochemistry, which was after 1907 and before 1908, I think. So, yeah. Um, other things that Schwarzschild did publish, uh, first one is on the equilibrium of the solar atmosphere in 1906. And here, uh, Carl discovered an equation which calculates radiative transfer, which is uh, simply defined as energy transfer through uh, electromagnetic radiation. And so he created an equation about this that calculates it through a medium in local thermodynamic equilibrium that both absorbs and emits radiation. And to be clear and expand on this kind of idea a little further, when something is in thermodynamic equilibrium, matter and energy that is contained within it is fairly stagnant or constant. And so the idea that's captured by this equation is ener any energy that is transferred electromagnetically through a place with such a state with a couple more nuances. And the equation which he found which is, again, known as Schwarzschild's uh, equation for radiative transfer. It relates to Planck's laws, or Planck's law and Beer's law, which both have to do with photochemistry as well as the identification of greenhouse gases in climate science. So it is quite important, even if, you know, not through astronomy. Photochemistry is a catch-all term that I'm using to uh, encapsulate uh, chemical phenomena here. So um, forgive me if I'm using the word incorrectly. Just basically, you know, uh, the chemical science behind electromagnetic radiation is what I'm trying to describe. Um, maybe not necessarily photochemistry, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Uh, in 1907... Uh, Carl Schwarzschild published about difference formulas for calculating optical systems, but I was not able to find any information on this work, so um, we're probably going to leave that as a label to mention. Uh, in 1908, uh, Schwarzschild published on the determination of vertex and apex according to the ellipsoid hypothesis from a small number of observed proper motions. And I can't really speak on this uh, work too much because I did not have access to the full text. But from the looks of it, um, sort of Schwarzschild started with the elliptic space and hy uh, hyperbolic uh, space. And 
It seems like with this work, maybe he took a turn towards an ellipsoidal model of the universe, um, which apparently, uh, with uh, very slight further reading online, is supposed to be more accurate and complete, but don't um, quote me on that. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. So now, with all of the stuff that he did before the Schwarzschild solution out of the way, we can now talk about the solution itself and the metric that comes with it. Uh, the Schwarzschild solution essentially came about when uh, Carl was investigating Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1916, I believe it is, and the specific case of the perihelion of Mercury. Mercury. He used a lot of spherical trig, polar coordinates, and calculus to create a proof that, quote, gives the observed anomaly of Mercury perihelion. And because it is advanced calculus, I can't really convey all of the mathematics that went behind it, so that's about as simple um, of a statement as I can put it in. Um, if we're going to go into that deeper, obviously, I have to summarize the whole proof that happens, which is not easy. You really have to just read it for yourself if you um, have the knowledge to be able to decipher what's even going on in the proof, which I actually don't. Um, but the Schwarzschild, uh, the Schwarzschild metric is something that comes out of the Schwarzschild solution, which is a specific representation of the solution in an equation. And what's interesting about this metric that we talk about is that it contains a Schwarzschild black hole within it, which is a black hole that doesn't have electric charge or angular momentum. And also, uh, the Schwarzschild solution has singularities when the radial coordinate is zero or equal to the Schwarzschild radius. And just for the record, if you don't know, uh, singularity in mathematics is a point at which a given mathematical object uh, is not defined. So just making that very clear. Um, also, the Schwarzschild radius is a physical parameter that defines the event horizon of a black hole. So what does this all mean? If we can't put all of this crazy stuff into simpler terms, why don't we just figure out um, what's important about all of this um, complex wording that we've got here. What the stuff above means is at times the Schwarzschild solution is split up into two parts whenever the uh, radius is equal to the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, that, that part of the solution is split up into two parts where one supports the gravitational fields of stars and planets and one is just something very 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 weird going on really. The singularity where the radial coordinate is zero illustrates either a physical singularity or a gravitational singularity. Obviously, when it's in the numbers, it's it's just a mathematical thing. But to interpret that mathematic, we have to, we either have to assume it's a physical singularity or a gravitational singularity, which is not quite clear. And so this opens up a Pandora's box of theories of relativity, which get really complicated. Um, for this matter, uh, we're probably going to need some Einstein context if we're going to get any deeper into these ideas. So for now, what we're going to do is we're going to leave it at that. Uh, I think we've built up quite a lot um, for the discoveries of Einstein. And um, even though we should be covering Schwarzschild stuff after, sort of this kind of building up to Einstein, I think is going to work out a lot better in the bigger picture of the episode. So unfortunately, some of these ideas that we're mentioning up here, all of this complex language, we won't be able to break down any further um, for now. So that is where I'm going to leave uh, things for this episode and the work of Schwarzschild. Uh, if you guys enjoyed listening to this podcast episode, I would sincerely, sincerely appreciate a follow on Spotify and a subscribe on YouTube. Uh, I will note that I did have to do a second take on this episode because I noticed that 
uh, the first recording had quite a lot of verbal static and I didn't want to put you guys through that. So uh, I have put a lot of extra work into this episode and if you've made it to the end of this episode and you listen to the full episode every single time, I very, very much appreciate you. And um, yeah, that's all I've got to say uh, until the next episode on Wednesday where I think we will be covering uh, Chandra Shekhar. Uh, I will see you all later. Peace.